Today we're going to build an Epix Fastload cartridge for the Commodore 64. It's an easy build and requires that we program an EEPROM. It significantly increases load speeds on the IEC bus for devices like the SD2 IEC and real drives. So let's build it. Right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services, or browse a library of talented maker's designs, add them to your cart, and have them delivered directly to your door. Firing up the trusty soldering iron, we set it to our usual working temperature of 330 degrees Celsius. Then we grab the isopropyl alcohol to clean down the board. Cleanliness is a stepping stone to soldering success. A dirty board won't take solder properly, and this will take off any oxidization or fingerprints. Let's fit the chip sockets first. None of the components on this build obstruct placement of other parts, so we can solder as we choose. The larger socket is for the EEPROM. It's a 28-pin dip or dill socket. Dip and dill are interchangeable terms, both meaning dual inline package. Pay attention to this notch. It should match the board it indicates the correct orientation of the chip. Once again, the gummy crew are on hand with a blob of icky sticky smurf poop. We'll use this to stop the socket dropping out whilst we're soldering its pins. Everybody knows that I love to use extra flux. It further helps the solder to take, and whilst not strictly essential, it brings me comfort. I'm using a new roll of solder, so it's a little unfamiliar, but I soon get used to it. As always, make sure you heat the pad and the leg at the same time. If these are not heated, then the solder will not flow, and you'll have a difficult time soldering. Capillary action is the magic of soldering. The molten solder races towards the heated surfaces and flows into any gaps if the surfaces are properly clean. Dislodging the smurf dung leaves us with a nicely fitted socket. Nice and rigid to the touch. Next is the smaller 14 pin socket. Again, we need to observe the notch and match it to our board. And a touch more of the blue wonder stuff to keep our part in place. Flux turns acidic when heated, dissolving any oxides into water and metal salts. These are then locked away in the flux as it dries around the solder joints. No clean fluxes become inert after use, not requiring cleaning. And the second socket is installed. Terry and Dave have brought me some passive components. First we'll install a 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitor. I had to cinch the legs slightly, otherwise I couldn't fit my part in. These are not polarised, so it's simply a matter of slipping it in and spreading its legs so it doesn't slip out. When soldering it's best to try and minimise the amount of time spent on the joint. Too long can damage the component. Next is a 0.47 tantalum capacitor. These are polarised, so be sure to install it the correct way around. The longer leg is positive on a capacitor, so matching the longest leg to the positive symbol on the PCB, we insert the part into the board. And we solder the tantalum capacitor into place.
and trim the excess leads with some flush side cutters. Where I protection for this, flush cutters push all the energy of the cut into the lead, so they shoot off. Now it's time to fit the 2.7 kilo ohm resistor. This is just a standard part, and the gummies have very kindly brought me one from the stock room. They're not polarized, so any way around is fine. Subject your part to the snip. And we can move on to the right angle tactile switch. This part is optional, but adds a really useful reset button to the C64. Although the switch won't drop out while soldering, it will wobble, so let's use a bit more Smurf poo. If the blue stuff gets hot, it tends to lose consistency, so I try to avoid using it on any parts that get overly heated. Removing the tack shows how warm it has been, and how it's become like a sticky chewing gum. This is easily fixed by dabbing the surface with some cool tack. It picks up any residue easily. Although this is a no clean flux, for looks, I like to clean the board down anyway. Again, this is just IPA. I use a soft brush to clean down the board under the watchful gaze of Terry and Dave. The 5V header is not required. It provides an alternative power source for your SD to IEC device, if you don't want to use the cassette port. I think this is looking pretty nice. A big shout out to John Harris, one of my lovely Patreon supporters, who also sent this board in. The smaller socket is home to this 74LS07 hex buffer IC. When inserting these, make sure that the notch on the chip matches the notch on the socket. Make sure that all of the legs are in the socket properly, on both sides. This looks pretty good. Now we need to program an EEPROM to fit into this socket. This particular board needs a 27C64 chip. I've bought 10 of these from AliExpress, all claiming to be ST branded 64 kilobit parts. Well, we'll see. The first thing we need to do is select the device from its part number. This is marked as an STM27C64A. So we put that into the box. SGS and ST merged decades ago, so we select the DIP28 version of the part number. Note this box that says Check ID. Each chip has a unique identifier that helps the programmer to select the right voltage, etc. By pressing the FF button, we can check to see if the chip is empty without trying to program it. This is called a blank check. But it fails, because the ID reported by the EEPROM doesn't match the part we selected. The chip's ID is 8FC2. Now, we could disable check ID and carry on, but that might not work properly. A quick internet search is our friend here, and using the chip ID plus the word EEPROM immediately returns some interesting links. In fact, the first link is to a Fairchild semiconductor part with the same 64 kilobit or 8 kilobyte capacity. It's a very good match for what we need, despite being 50 nanoseconds slower than the ST part. I checked all these EEPROMs, and they're all the same part code, 
despite being a multitude of colours. I remarked them all with their real part number. Having found the real information on our EEPROM, we select the correct part in the programming software. Again, Fairchild and NSC merged many, many years ago too, and the parts are the same. We select the DIP28 version and hit the select button. Running the blank check again shows that we have the correct part and the programmable section of the EEPROM is blank and ready for programming. Now we can load our binary file into the buffer for programming the chip. The downloaded file has a few versions for different EEPROM types, but we select the one that matches our 2764. We leave the format as binary. We can't change the destination, Likewise, load mode is normal and the buffer will be cleared with the default FF value. Upon loading, we can see some readable text noting Scott Nelson as the author back in 1984. If we wanted, we could check all the data here, but that's not required. After all of our detective work, we can now program the EEPROM using the P button. Leaving all the values at default and checking our chip orientation, we simply press program. Programming takes two and a half seconds and verification takes about a fifth of a second. We can program more EEPROMs now, but we only need one. We remove our imposter from the Mini Pro. The remarking on this chip is very low quality. and the gummy crew stand guard whilst we install our program chip into the fast load cart. Again, it's worth mentioning to check the legs are all inserted properly on both sides. This quartz window will need to be covered to prevent eventual UV erasure, but we'll test it first. Well, here's our completed board, and I hope you're as excited to try it out as I am. We'll be using my later model C64 wedge style. And my Arcada joystick. For our speed tests, we'll use my trusty old SD2 IEC from thefuturewas8bit.com. The data cable goes into the serial port and power comes from the cassette port. For audio and video, we'll be using this cable from Retro Computer Shack, a great shop on eBay. Although I'm keen to test our cart, first we'll do a time test without the fast load cartridge installed. I'm using File Browser 64 here. Navigating to my games directory, I picked the first game in the list, Bomb Jack, and let's start the timer running. I'll actually speed up this footage because it's going to take ages. Even though the SD2 IEC is an SD card device, it's limited by the very slow IEC bus built into the C64. And at a load time of 1 minute and 32 seconds, it's much faster than tape, but still really slow for less than 64K of data from a drive. Time to test our cart. Powering off, we excitedly ram it into the rear as far as we can. Then we power on again and are greeted with a ready prompt, adorned with fast load. 
So far, so good. Let's load File Browser 64 again. Selecting the same BombJack disk image, we ready the timer. And go. I'm not speeding up this footage because the load time should be significantly faster. And in fact, BombJack loads in a tenth of the time, taking an astonishing 13 seconds. Now that was fast. So, what do you think of this little project? It's a lot of fun to build and speeds up SD2IEC load times fantastically. I've not tested on a real drive, but I've read that it also speeds those up to a lesser extent. Massive thanks to my amazing patrons here on the screen right now. You can join them and help support my work on this channel at patreon.com forward slash markfixesstuff. Thanks so much for watching and supporting the channel. Please like, share and subscribe, and maybe take a look at these other videos. See you there. Bye.